Hello, my name is Jason Allen Scott, and I feel like the world is moving too fast. At least it feels that way to me. And I often just want everything to slow down. I want a moment. I want a moment to breathe. I want to think of a simpler time. Call me nostalgic, and at the risk of dating myself like a fly caught inside amber, Jurassic Park reference, <laughs> allow me to say it wasn't that long ago that music was something you went into a store for. Something you would pick up, something you would hold, something you would feel, something you would contemplate, you would think about, you would touch, you'd move around, you'd smell the very vinyl, you'd read the back, you'd wonder who the featured artists were. And if you were lucky, you'd go into a small booth and listen to it, all before making the purchase. And today, all of that is available on stream and online. Funny, just today, I was on the tube and I saw an advert on the wall of the station that simply said, remember when you tried on clothes before buying them. Your car is waiting, Uber. Well, due to the pandemic, we all stopped shopping offline. We stopped shopping in stores and that was just a year ago. The truth is just a year ago, I had friends who had never ever shopped for clothes online. And it wasn't that long ago that our loved ones or family members would speak to us powerful words like, how are you? And I love you. And it was something that was said aloud on a device plugged into a wall that the average Gen Z would not be able to recognize today. It wasn't that long ago that turning 16 came with a driver's license and a set of car keys, not a TikTok account or an opportunity to speak your mind on Clubhouse. So much change, so much change amongst the crisis that we currently see. And it is not, is it not in change that we all feel unstable, unsettled? Now, just 13 years ago, I worked in venues, 2008, and that was a time much like today, shrouded in crisis. I felt like it was a time of, of two times, a good time and a bad time, the best of times and the worst of times. Nobody had money to spend on my venues, but the emergence of social network technologies and platforms creating social communication technologies was growing at a super fast speed. People, consumerism, connectivity and communication became something to pay attention to, and that made it better times. The thing about 2008 and any time of crisis is truly, it's a time of revolution. It's those times where anything predictable, anything certain becomes uncertain and unpredictable, but that same time that gives us nothing to put our faith into. I didn't know if times would get better or worse. And a lot of us feel like that now, but the truth is we do have something to hold on to, and it's called history. We have history to fall back on. I had my own personal history. I had seen the doom of apartheid in South Africa. I'd seen AIDS come and go. I'd seen a tsunami in Thailand and the after effects of a large wave. I was in not one, but two ISIS attacks. And there was a pattern. Times like the ones I've just mentioned and the ones we're in right now, they come to pass, they don't come to stay. But what follows them is accelerated change. Like the times before this in human history, in times pre-crisis, time moves pretty slow, if you will, in human years. But in times in crisis and times shortly after, it seems to move in dog years. And in these periods of change or crisis, everything changes. Our forms of government, our means of commerce, our modes of transportation, our materials of construction, and the distribution and creation of wealth. Not to mention where and how people work. Every world change has happened quickly in these compressed moments. And there's always a pattern in all these moments of history following crisis and these periods of crisis themselves. They always seem to coincide with two things, a new communication paradigm and a new energy paradigm. 10,000 years ago, energy was stored in a grain. And that, that is how we saw it. That is how we saw movement. And that is how we saw fuel. The grain allowed the horses to move. It's the grain that allowed us to move. It was the grain that stored value. And with that, our language changed. We went from spoken word to written language. So communication changed. And shortly after that, we had the industrial age. And the energy paradigm, pew, pew, 
was the steam engine, the ability to harness power using this power, the power of steam. And the power of steam gave us the steam engine and steam factories and the communication paradigm, the printing press and everything changed. We moved from farm to factory and wealth shifted from nobility to the merchant class. Everything changed. Now take your mind to 1870. The energy was oil and oil allowed for the internal combustion engine. And the communication paradigm was the telephone I mentioned earlier that no one could recognize. The combustion engine made us more powerful by making us more portable because it allowed the car and the airplane to get us anywhere. And with this communication paradigm of the telephone, we were now reachable to anyone in any destination, in any time zone. I could now get to them or speak to them anywhere, anytime, accessibly. And they were accessible. And again, everything changed. Work moved from the factory to the office. And this provided a sweeping change, a destabilizing change, which brings us to today. So for those of us, for those of you who feel unsettled by the recent year we've all just had, take comfort with me that we are once again in a period of change. Change like the ones I just mentioned and the paradigms that are shaping this age are sustainability and network communications. Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Signal, Slack, Clubhouse, Snapchat, BitCloud, OnlyFans, network communications that are connected in my pocket, buzzing periodically, connecting me to the millions of people around the world. It's no longer one-on-one -on -one with another on a phone connected to the world, connected through a wall. Now I've made my living, and some might say a damn good one, with no tool other than my phone, WhatsApp, Twitter, Facebook, and a podcast. Literally, thanks to this small device, I am now connected to everyone, and I have the ability to work anywhere. You see these two elements, sustainability and network communications, they weave themselves into the very DNA of every layer of society that is now being written. So this new crisis, what this is, is a new movement. And in any new movement of change, we will see wealth distribution. And dare I say it, opportunity. So although at times like these, you all may feel the world is rushing at us way too fast, we have to remind ourselves of the words of the great Missy Elliott to flip it and reverse it. To rather than being the victim of change, have the opportunity to call ourselves change makers. And in these moments of crisis that we can't predict, let us not find opportunity to be scared, but find opportunity to be brave, to, to understand that certain things are just inevitable, that the time right now will be messy. Look at the transportation revolution in play right now. Right at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned Uber, invented in San Francisco in 1999. Well, five years later, the yellow cab industry that was the taxi industry for the whole of the United States of America that had existed for 80 years prior went bankrupt. We know these things will get messy. We saw Paris being attacked when Uber came in. We saw riots when 5G started implementation throughout the world. We saw outrage by the hotel industry when Airbnb came into new markets. We know that what is to come is also transformative. These years we are in now, these are not human years. These are dog years. These are dog years. These are dog times when things move fast and we completely change the plumbing of society. And again, I shall name drop Uber. 
Did you know that the taxi industry revenue in San Francisco in 2010 was $140 million? It was scalable. It was predictable. It was reliable. But just five years later after Uber, Uber not only driven the entire yellow cabs industry bankrupt and out of San Francisco alone, it had made $500 million by 2014. We also know that today, the guiding light of sustainability that is, dare I call it, this revolution that we're in, it's sustainable. It's also personal. These apps in our pocket make it uniquely personal. Uber is my personal driver, available at a few taps of the app that pick me up anywhere and any time to take me where I need to go simply frictionlessly, taking me anywhere and any time. Deliveroo, Uber Eats, Postmates, my personal chef. A few taps of the app and I can find food from anywhere in the area, delivered from fire to my door in minutes. Upwork, people per hour, Fiverr, my personal workforce. The ability to reach into my pocket and a few taps of the app and employees somewhere on the planet can do a unit of work or a project. I can get an expert for hire that can do work quickly, efficiently, and remotely. Airbnb, my personal hotel, unlocking millions of properties around the world. And if you'll allow me to share mine with you right now, copus.com my personal workplace or event space, my personal venue seeker, location scout, and real estate agent ever out there on the lookout for the perfect office space, event space, or fit for purpose place to work and celebrate. Available on my time with the charge that they're happy with, the venue, and I'm happy with, the worker, the planner, in real time to be booked for how long I need without waiting for a quote or a site visit. And this is where I've landed in this time, in this space, in this here revolution. You see, as an event planner, as an ex venue owner operator, I was always selling space as a service, space for parties, space for product launches, space for club nights and celebrations and commiserations, but also for providing my space for film locations, for studio time, for charity work. And copus.com is where my passion has now taken me. And a quick pro quo, though, I knew nothing about commercial real estate. And the truth is, you don't need to know anything. It's incredibly simple. And for those that don't know, allow me this moment to inform you. Commercial real estate owners, well, they just build buildings. And we, we put our companies in them. And the business model is we sign a long lease, usually five to 10 years plus, meaning companies that need to make things. They need to and make services, also need to make huge decisions. Where will I plant my company? Where will I be for the next five to 10 years? Where will I tell all my employees to come? For me, when I was 25, I started my first company. We were called OPM, Other People's Money, and we were growing fast. So I was told I needed to get an office. And back then, five years was the shortest lease I could find. I didn't know if we should... If, if, if we could, if we would even survive another month, another quarter, let alone another year to five. But I signed one huge loft-like floor, enough space to grow into. And spoiler alert, we didn't. We never even moved into half the space. All that extra real estate I was paying for simply went to waste which reminds me of my first space that I ran in events as an owner operator. I'd be paying for this space that was only being used three to four days a week, leaving multiple days and multiple hours that I was simply not running a monetization strategy for my underutilized assets. Now add injury to insult. On this space that I was paying for, I also had food and booze and the time of my staff was spending that I was just paying for, whether we've been used or not, time, food, space, staff, rent, all perishable assets. And I'll tell you something else that you all already probably know. Work doesn't just happen in the spaces or workplaces anymore. It's not a place I go to. It's just something that I do. And regrettably, perhaps, 
I could reach out for the phone next to my bed in the early morning or before getting out of bed or before going to sleep. I can check my emails and I can answer client calls. And all of this is a shame. And I hope I'm not shaming you. Let's be honest. We'll do it. Work now is everywhere because the internet is everywhere. The old model of space to fit a single purpose is over. Events went online last, last year. Pandora's box has been opened. Single serving space is stupid. There, I said it. Office for office workers, event space for events, galleries only for art, a home only for renting for yourself, and hotels only for sleeping. Damn stuff. Insert naughty giggles here. Overnight is outdated and at very best wasteful. It is not sustainable. And let me tell you an old story that some of you might know incredibly well. It's about a teacher and a glass jar. The teacher walks into a class carrying this glass jar. She asks them, what can they see? The students, excited about this opportunity to speak aloud, scream, an empty jar. At least they did in my story. She said, I see. And she placed the jar down. She pulled from her bag a bunch of rocks and filled the jar up right to the top and said again, quick question, is this glass now full? To which the kids excitingly exclaimed, yes, teacher. The teacher smiled knowingly, reached into her bag and grabbed gravel and added the gravel and the gravel filled the space between the rocks until it was full. And again, the teacher asked, is this glass full? And again, without hesitation, the kids excitedly screamed, yes. And again, she smiled. And this time, added sand. And the sand fell between the gravel, between the rocks. And again, she held it up to class and said, is it full now? This time, the kids double-checking and triple-checking around the jar and looking around confirmed, yes, the jar is now full. And then she added the water. And everyone in the class began to laugh. The truth is, this is how we have been operating in our venues and our spaces for far too long. We have filled it with rocks, the space only to be a single serving place, only for product launches or celebrations or restaurants that only serve meals at certain times, a photo studio only to take photos in. I mean, the truth is, there's always been an opportunity to add gravel. And for many of us, gravel was catering. And for those of us that also added sand, we added something small like private dining, space for a birthday party. If the truth is that each time we believed we were full, we were not, well, that means that there is always plenty of opportunity for more. It is the first event professional, I was the first event professional in the UK to make a million in 12 months, from zero to a million, from nothing. I kept finding uses for my space at every opportunity. And four years later, I did it again. I made a million in five months because I always saw the glass, not as the kids did, but as the teacher did. And right now I'm telling you, just like the teacher told those kids, there is space for more for all of us. More workplaces for remote workers, for freelancers, for urban digital creatives, for the gig economy workers. Our venue, our venue landscape today is that glass and the rocks or how we try to fill the buildings is just one thing that we do. And we're about to start what many economists are calling the next roaring 20s. Yet almost every site, venue, landscape that we have surveyed is at least 10% empty at any given time. Because we cannot fill the vessel with rocks alone. We need the gravel and the sand and the water. These empty sections and spaces that sit empty, underutilized, ready to be modernized and monetized. I'm here to tell you that these buildings were overpaying for these spaces. And surely what we have done is not sustainable, let alone effective. And worse than that is that not only is the business manager or property owner losing money, but people like me, desperate in 1997 for a workplace with long leases, just needed it for a couple of days, a couple of hours to test our theories, to test our products, our services, our hypotheses. And let's put on our Greta Thunberg lenses and look at things from a sustainable perspective or for the capitalist and the audience, 
Let's look at it with an economic utilization standpoint. This is very, very inefficient. And if we go back into the gritter mode and look at the environment, the building model is inadequate in today's lens of true sustainability statistics. Did you know, as this is a USA and Canada talk, that you have 79% of the USA's electric consumption powers buildings. Let me say that again, and let me say it slow. 79% of the US electricity consumption powers nothing but buildings. And 39% of the world's carbon footprint is causing the global warming, affecting us all. 39% from buildings that are just sitting there, underutilized. In fact, even venues that are supposedly quote unquote, 100% occupied. The reality is based on hundreds of surveys to the market that prove that the typical, let's call it hotel room for easy understanding is underutilized even at 100%. It's only 30% of the time been used by the occupier. So what can you do? Well, the answer is clear. It's clear as the glass the teacher brought to class. We need to fill that glass. And I'm proud to say it's in play right now. The same apps you use are transforming real estate and venues like never before in a time we've seen. And the two big pieces we needed to fit the jigsaw are once again in motion, technology and network communications to rethink how real estate and events, workplaces and meeting spaces, renting takes place. It starts with online. The internet is now. The internet is now where we can book offices, studio, and event locations. Bookings can and will happen online through technology. And the second piece, which let's be honest, is far less sexy, but no less critical, the framework of the paperwork, you know, the terms and conditions, the small print, all of that can be simplified. We can standardize. And this is not so far removed, so far removed from what currently occurs at your local hotel when you agree to stay over. It's online. It's simple. It's end to end. And what does that look like? I'm happy to share that both workplaces and event spaces are embracing this new revolution. That spaces and places of all kinds are becoming available like that with a tap of the app and companies of all kinds are putting up their space placing their studio event or hospitality venue on platforms like copus.com k-o-p-u-s.com and they like jurassic park mentioned previously at the start of this talk if you were paying attention have found a way the pandemic gave us the motivation, and likewise, to the professionals on the go, the CEOs of startups, the, the freelancers, the writers, the bloggers, the YouTubers, the podcasters, the content creators, the photographers, the gig workers, the up workers, the Fiverr people, the people per hour, and the Etsy and Shopify generation, and the like. Well, they can now find a home to work, to create, to launch, to network, to make, to test, to share. So in these times of crisis and change, when the fabric of time is rewritten, human years and dog ears, oftentimes there is an old guard that is simply swept away. But like crypto, you can plot these things with peaks and troughs. I mentioned economists earlier. Well, today they're pointing at a peak, a peak in the disease of Corona at a time when simply the growth begins to slow and opportunity for change begin. And it exists in a larger quantity than the status quo to continue. It is with the advent of Uber and Google and Tesla working on autonomous cars that people are now talking about peak car manufacturing. 
and if you will allow me to put my passions applied into events and spaces as service and as an entrepreneur are not many things working in a similar way now in our very own events landscape I think we can now look at this moment, this phenomena of peak single service purpose space, a space designed to do just one thing, for office space to be used just for office workers, space for event functions just for event functions, meeting rooms just for meetings, galleries just for art, hotels just for overnight accommodation, studios just for photo shoots, sports hospitality suites just for game seasons and restaurants, just for the night or day in which they apply their trade. I ask if things like copus.com, the Airbnb of event space and workplaces is happening. Can we not characterize this time as the great revolution of monetizing the underutilized in a way that is sustainable? Is this not the time for us to share and to utilize and to harvest these spaces that already exist, that are already constructed? So that hopefully in the next 10, 20, or 50 years, someone on a stage or virtual presentation, much like this one, will look back. Look back at this current time that we're in now. Look back for the future to then back to the future age myself again and say those those people were the revolutionists those were the crazy ones they were the bold those were the ones who said let's not build anymore let's not be wasteful let's stop making for the sake of making let's make more with what we have maybe people in the future can look back and talk about how we made a better future for them, how we never let our humanity supersede our technology, but that we let our technology and sustainability work for us to weave a future that we could all be proud of. We all have the chance now to improve the present, to create more for ourselves with what we have, to take the underutilized and monetize. And has Halil the Elder once said, if not now, when? And if not you, who? Let's change the world together. Thank you. <laughs>